Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Duncan Brown and I'm a trustee with the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. I hope this webinar finds all of those tuned in safe and well. Before I introduce Dr. Dr. John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago, a quick announcement regarding the logistics of tonight's webinar. We are using the Zoom webinar platform tonight, so everyone is automatically muted and will stay muted. Additionally, the only persons you should see on your screen will be myself or Dr. Mearsheimer. Tonight's webinar will include remarks by Dr. By Dr. Mearsheimer followed by a Q&A session. Audience questions will be handled through the Q&A function in Zoom. The Q&A button should be located on the bottom of your screen. Just click on the button, type in your question, select goes to everyone and hit submit. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Baltimore Council of Foreign Affairs YouTube website in about two weeks. And now to tonight's speaker. Dr. John Mearsheimer is the Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1982. He is a West Point grad and served five years as an officer in the US Air Force. He received his master's degree in international relations from the University of Southern California and his doctorate in government and international relations from Cornell. In his early career, Dr. Mearsheimer was a research fellow at the Brookings Institution a postdoc fellow at Harvard Center for International Affairs and a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Professor Mearsheimer has written extensively about security issues and international politics. He has published six books, including his latest, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities, published in 2018, which has been translated into five different languages, was a Financial Times Best Book of 2018 and was the recipient of the 2019 Best Book of the Year Award from the Valdai Discussion Conference in Moscow. Professor Mearsheimer has also written many articles that have appeared in academic journals like International Security and popular magazines like Foreign Affairs and the London Review of Books. He has also written op-ed pieces for newspapers, including the New York Times, the Financial Times, dealing with topics like Bosnia, nuclear proliferation, US policy towards India, the failure of the Arab-Israeli peace efforts, the folly of invading Iraq, the causes of the Ukrainian crisis, and the likelihood of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. Please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual, welcome to Dr. John Mearsheimer. And sir, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Duncan, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here before the Baltimore Council. Uh, it was many years ago now that I gave a talk, which was not virtual because we didn't do virtual talks in those days uh, before the council. Uh, the subject on the table tonight is uh, US historical role in the world, America's historical role in the world since 1945, uh, liberalism, nationalism, and realism. Now, what I wanna do tonight is I wanna talk about America's foreign policy, American, uh, America's position in the world, how it operated from 1945 up to the present. And I wanna talk about that in the context of how it relates to liberalism and nationalism and realism. So these three isms will figure prominently in my story as I tell you how to think about US foreign policy and America's position in the world between 1945 and the present. Now, my starting point is that you wanna realize that the world that I grew up in, that Duncan grew up in, and I assume a number of people in the audience grew up in, has changed in fundamental ways between 1945 and now. From 1945 to roughly 1989, this period that was called the Cold War, we lived, or we operated, the United States operated in a bipolar system. There were two great powers, or what we called superpowers back in the day, on the planet, the United States and the Soviet Union. Then, as you all know, in 1989, the Cold War ended, and in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And we went from bipolarity to unipolarity. It's very important to understand that the glacis plates moved in the late 
1980s, early 1990s. And we shifted from bipolarity to unipolarity. What has happened since roughly 2017 is that the glacis plates have shifted again. And we have gone from unipolarity to multipolarity. So in effect, we went from bipolarity to unipolarity to multipolarity. And I would assume that most of the young people in the audience grew up in the unipolar world. And your way of thinking about the world was grooved during the unipolar moment. What you have to understand is that world has gone away. And we are in a fundamentally different world now. We're in a multipolar world where there are three great powers. Those three great powers, of course, are China, Russia, and the United States. So it used to be the Soviet Union and the United States in the bipolar world. Then in the unipolar world, it was just Uncle Sam. And now we have China, Russia, and the United States. And when the glacis plates shift like that, it has profound consequences for international politics and profound consequences for the United States. You just have to understand that, right? Because the structure of the system matters so much. So the story that I wanna tell you tonight is that during the bipolar period that I was born into and raised in, realism dominated. Then when we moved into the unipolar moment, realism in very important ways was taken off the table for the United States and liberalism became the dominant foreign policy motif for the United States. And that liberalism was thwarted at point after point by nationalism. Now we are back in a realist world. The liberalism nationalism tension that we saw in the unipolar moment has been replaced by realism again. Now, let me lay out for you why that's the case. In a bipolar world where you have two great powers or in a multipolar like the world, like the one we're in now, the great powers have to be concerned with competing with each other. It's a realist world by definition because the great powers have to worry about each other because they're both so powerful. They engage in security competition. They worry constantly about the balance of power. You see that in bipolarity, you see that in multipolarity. In the unipolar world, there is by definition only one great power. And again, that was Uncle Sam. And you cannot have great power politics in a unipolar system because by definition, there's only one great power, which means that that great power is free to pursue an ideological foreign policy if it wants. And of course, that's exactly what the United States did. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So again, you see what happened here. You went from the Cold War, which was characterized by a bipolar system where realpolitik dominated to a unipolar world where realpolitik was largely taken off the table for the United States. And the United States was free to pursue a liberal foreign policy where it ran into trouble with nationalism. And then we moved out of the unipolar moment into the present world, which is a multipolar world where you have great powers back on the table. You have three great powers. And surprise of surprises, those great powers are engaged in great power competition because that comes with the territory. So that's sort of the overarching edifice that frames my comments tonight. Now I'd like to talk in a bit more detail about each of those periods, uh, not so much the Cold War, but I'd like to talk a lot more about the unipolar moment and also the new multipolar world that we're moving into. It's back to the Cold War. Back to the Cold War, you had the United States and the Soviet Union 
which were the two gorillas in the system. And as you all know, they competed uh, intensely. They competed intensely for power. We competed in Europe, we competed in East Asia, uh, we competed all over the third world. Uh, a lot of people argued at the time that the competition was fundamentally an ideological competition, right? It was the, uh, the communist Soviet Union up against the liberal capitalist United States of America. And it was that ideological competition that was the defining feature of the US-Soviet competition. I don't think that was the case at all. This was good old fashioned great power politics. Both the United States and the Soviet Union did all sorts of things that contradicted their liberal or communist ideologies and acted in a real politique way. But what happened of course in this competition is that the Soviet Union lost out. Uh, because of certain weaknesses in, in the Soviet system, uh, it began to fall apart and began to fall way behind the United States in that security competition. And therefore, uh, at the end of the 1980s, it decided to opt out of the game. And of course, as you all know, in 1991, what happened was that the Soviet Union fell apart. And uh, the one remnant state that really mattered was Russia. And Russia was not a great power. Russia was a basket case in the 1990s. And that's of course why we talk about the unipolar moment. Now, when you get to the unipolar moment, the United States no longer has to worry about security competition. I tried to drive this point home to you before because there's no other great power to compete with. The United States in effect is free to pursue an ideological foreign policy. And of course, that's exactly what it does. It's so powerful relative to every other state on the planet, because there's no other great powers, right? That it can use its military might and its economic might to pursue liberal hegemony. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is liberal hegemony? Well, liberal hegemony is the foreign policy that almost all of you saw your country practice during the unipolar moment. And it had three dimensions to it. And those three dimensions are all closely related. The first dimension, and in many ways, the most important, was to spread democracy across the planet. The idea was to turn every country on the planet into a liberal democracy. The key article that was written just as the Cold War was ending that captured the essence of this policy was Francis Fukuyama's very famous article, The End of History. Basically what Frank Fukuyama said in that piece is that we had won the Cold War. Liberal Democratic America had won the Cold War. We had defeated fascism in the first half of the 20th century, communism in the second half of the 20th century. And now all that was really left was liberal democracy. And what was going to happen is that liberal democracy was going to inexorably spread all over the planet. And of course, what we decided to do in the early 1990s was to juice that process, to speed it up. And we were willing, as you all know, and I'll talk more about this, to use military force to speed up that process. But the idea was that we would turn the planet into a space that was populated with nothing but liberal democracies. So that's the first aim. The second aim is to get all sorts of states integrated into the open international economy. The idea is to get them hooked on capitalism because of course, if everybody is hooked on capitalism, they become prosperous. And if they become prosperous, they're not gonna to go to war with each other because who would want to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs? And going back to the first aim, remember what the first aim was to spread democracy. It's widely believed in the American foreign policy establishment that democracies don't fight other democracies. So if you can spread democracy all over the planet, 
number one. Number two, you can get countries integrated into the open international economy and make them prosperous. Not only will they be prosperous, but they won't fight wars because again, who would wanna kill the goose that lays the golden egg? The third goal was to integrate states into international institutions. Because if you're integrated into an international institution, you become a responsible stakeholder, a law-abiding citizen in the international community. As you all know, international institutions are all about rules and obeying the rules. So if you get states embedded in these international institutions and they obey the rules, that too reduces the likelihood of conflict and it works to promote prosperity. Let me give you an example of, of this at play. Uh, NATO expansion. Uh, as you know, in the mid 1990s, the Clinton administration decided to expand NATO eastward. And a lot of people now say this was designed to contain the Russian threat. This is not true. We didn't see a Russian threat in the 1990s because there wasn't one. We didn't see a Russian threat until 2014 because there wasn't one. The reason that we were expanding NATO and expanding the European Union and promoting the color revolutions in places like Ukraine and Georgia. Remember the orange revolution in Georgia and the rose revolution, excuse me, the orange revolution in Ukraine and the rose revolution in Georgia, you remember them. The purpose of NATO expansion, EU expansion and the color revolutions was to spread liberal democracy, number one, that's what the color revolutions are, spread liberal democracy spread institutions, the European Union, NATO, and to spread prosperity, get them hooked on capitalism. That's what spreading the EU is all about. So NATO expansion, EU expansion, and the color revolutions were not designed to contain the Soviet Union, excuse me, not designed to contain Russia. They were designed to pursue liberal hegemony, basically to make the world look like the United States. And again, the argument is if you can make the world look like the United States, we'll all live happily ever after because then every state will be a democracy. Democracies don't fight other democracies and we'll all be prosperous, we'll all be rich. And if we're all rich, why would anybody in their right mind wanna start a war? So this was a very attractive strategy or policy for the foreign policy elite in this country and they pursued it vigorously but it was a colossal failure. And indeed, it's one of the principal reasons, uh, not the only reason, but one of the principal reasons that Donald Trump got elected in 2016. You should understand, and I could lay this out in the Q&A period for anybody who's interested, that Donald Trump ran against liberal hegemony. He ran against the foreign policy establishment. He said liberal hegemony was a colossal failure and he was right and it helped him get elected. Now. The question is, why did it fail? There are a number of reasons that it failed, but one of the principal reasons was nationalism. Nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. Nationalism says that we all belong to nations and those nations should have their own state. A nation is a social group that has a handful of defining characteristics. There is this phenomenon called the American nation. And this American nation has its own state. It's a nation state. The world is populated with nation states. Why is it populated with nation states? Because nationalism is such a powerful political ideology, right? Now, the problem that we faced is that modern nation states do not like the idea of other nation states interfering in their politics. Nationalism is inextricably bound up with the concept of sovereignty, with the concept of self-determination. Just think about how the American people feel 
when the Soviet, excuse me, when Russia is said to interfere in our politics, you remember how upset everybody was in 2016 and they talked about it again in 2020 at the thought of the Russians or the Iranians or the Chinese interfering in our politics. Our basic view is how dare they do that? We're a sovereign state. We are a sovereign nation state. And as a sovereign nation state, we do not want anyone interfering in our politics and telling us what our politics should look like. The problem here is that liberal hegemony is all about interfering in the politics of other countries. You're basically going into places like Afghanistan. You're going into places like Iraq. You're interfering in places like Russia and China, all for the purpose of doing social engineering, of helping them to become democratic. That's the name of the game. Are you surprised that the Russians and the Chinese go ballistic over the fact that the United States is trying to spread democracy into those countries? Are you surprised that the Chinese are very upset about American interference in Hong Kong? You shouldn't be. If you're an American who doesn't like the idea of the Russians or the Chinese interfering in our politics, you should surely understand why the Chinese don't like us interfering in Hong Kong, or the Russians don't like us interfering in their politics and trying to topple Putin and turn Russia into a liberal democracy. It makes perfect sense. As my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So you see, we have this very powerful political ideology in the system, right, called nationalism. And nationalism makes it very difficult for a country like the United States to interfere in the politics of other countries and shape their political system. But that's exactly what liberal hegemony was all about. Just think about the Bush doctrine. We don't talk much about the Bush doctrine anymore because it was a colossal failure. But the Bush doctrine, if you go back and look, was designed to go into countries in the Middle East, starting with Afghanistan, going to Iraq, and then maybe going to Iran or Syria and turning all of those countries into liberal democracies. That was our goal. It sounds crazy now because it was a colossal failure. Again, this is what helped get Donald Trump elected. But that was the goal. Remember how optimistic we were in the early 1990s. We were full of piss and vinegar. We really thought we were on top of the world. We thought we were going to take all this power we had now that we were in a unipolar world and we were going to reshape the world in our interest, liberal hegemony. That was our goal. And it all failed. And what I'm saying to you is one of the reasons it failed is because of nationalism. It is very hard to do social engineering in the modern world. I want to tell you one quick story on that. When I was a young boy slash man, the Vietnam War took place. I was an enlisted man in the U.S. Army from 1965 to 1966. I went to West Point from 1966 to 1970. And then I was in the Air Force from 1970 to 1975. That was effectively coterminous with the Vietnam War. Uh, first Marines land in Da Nang in March of 1965. I went in the Army in June 65. And of course, Saigon Falls in the spring of seven. As, spring of 75, and I got out of the Air Force uh, in the summer of 75. Um, the one thing uh, I learned during those years uh, about the Vietnam War was that the Vietnamese were not fighting because we were because they were communists. This was not communism versus liberal democracy. Uh, the, the Vietnamese fought like wild dogs because of nationalism. They wanted their own nation state. They fought against the French, and then they fought against us. They believed in self-determination. The Vietnamese people wanted a Vietnamese nation state, just like the United States. They wanted an independent, sovereign state, and they were willing to fight and die for that. And I came to understand in those days, you do not want to militarily, or even non-militarily, get seriously involved in trying to do social engineering in a foreign country because they'll fight back, just as we fight back when we see any evidence that the Russians are interfering in our politics. So all of this is to tell you that during the unipolar moment, 
we adopted a liberal foreign policy that realism was pushed aside because we didn't have to worry about security competition. And this liberal foreign policy basically failed. And it basically failed because of nationalism and one other factor. Now, what was that other factor? As part of liberal hegemony, we worked over time to integrate China into the open international economy. And we worked over time to integrate China into international institutions like the World Trade Organization. And the end result is that China became very wealthy. They already had a lot of people, but they became very wealthy. And you know what this means? It means that China, by about 2016, was a great power. It was a great power. And you remember what I said, in unipolarity, you can pursue liberal hegemony. You can pursue an ideological foreign policy in unipolarity because the United States doesn't have to worry about great power competition. But once China is a great power, you're back in the game. Realpolitik is back on the table. Of course, as you well know, it was not simply China that became a great power. The Russians came back from the dead under Vladimir Putin. It took a while because the system uh, in Russia was so rotten uh, by the time Putin takes power at the turn of the century that it takes him a good decade plus to get the Russians back on their feet. But by 2016, there's been a res resurrection of Russian power. So now you are in a multipolar world where you have Russia, China, and the United States. Again, you went from bipolarity to unipolarity, and now we're in a multipolar world. I'd like to talk a little bit about this multipolar world that we're in, and uh, which I think as far as you're concerned, and I'm concerned, will be uh, the defining feature of international politics moving forward, or as far as the eye can see. I think among those three great powers, there are two of them that matter the most by far, and that's the US and China. Russia is far less powerful than either China or the United States. Uh, and uh, it's a declining power over great time, over, over time. Uh, all of the Russophobia in the United States uh, is uh, not worth paying attention to. This idea that Russia's a great threat, maybe Russia's a greater threat than China is ridiculous. Uh, Russia's not a, a serious threat to the United States in any way, shape or form. Uh, and China is a serious threat. Uh, and the US-China competition is going to be the principal dyad uh, moving forward. It's of enormous importance for us. Now, why is that the case? China is going to try to dominate Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. China is going to try to become a regional hegemon. It's going to try to become the only great power in Asia and do everything it can to make sure it is much more powerful than all its neighbors. Is this a good thing? From a Chinese point of view, it's a wonderful thing. It's exactly what we did. The United States worked very hard from 1783, when we finally got our independence from Britain up to the present, to create a regional hegemon. We're now a regional hegemon. It happened in about 1900. The United States finally became a regional hegemon. It's the ideal position in the world if you're interested in maximizing your security to be a regional hegemon. How many of you Americans in the audience go to bed at night worrying about Canada or Mexico attacking us? Or you worry about Guatemala or even Brazil attacking us? None of you worry about that. No country in the Western hemisphere would dare attack the United States. And we have the Monroe Doctrine, which tells foreign powers they can't move military forces into the Western Hemisphere. It's verboten. Makes perfect sense from our point of view. We want to be a regional hegemon. 
Well, don't you think the Chinese want to be a regional hegemon too? Don't you think they want to imitate us? They do. It makes perfect sense from their point of view. So what's going to happen here is that China is going to try to become the most powerful country in Asia, and it's going to go to great lengths to push the United States out. Right? Uh, they're going to go to great lengths to formulate a Monroe Doctrine of their own. And if I was the national security advisor in Beijing, that's exactly what I'd do. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, what are the Americans going to do? Well, I can tell you what the Americans are going to do. We're going to go to great lengths to contain China and do everything we can to make sure it does not become a regional hegemon. In the 20th century, we faced four potential peer competitors, four countries that were pursuing regional hege hegemony. One was Imperial Germany, two was Imperial Japan, three was Nazi Germany, and four was the Soviet Union. We played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. The fact is the United States does not tolerate peer competitors. We want a world in which there's one peer, one, one regional hegemon, us. So we are going to go to great lengths to contain China and to prevent the Chinese from dominating Asia. That means we're going to have an intense security competition and there's going to be a serious possibility of war between the United States and China. I am not arguing that war is for sure, that we are axiomatically going to get war. I'm arguing we are axiomatically going to get security competition. You know, a lot of people these days say, oh, President Trump, um, it was certainly tough on the Chinese, but President-elect Biden, once he moves into the White House, he'll be kind of a pussycat and we'll, we'll you know, have good relations with the Chinese moving forward. That's not the case. Uh, Biden will be very tough, tough on the Chinese. Biden will go to great lengths to contain China, as he should. Uh, there won't be that much difference between a Trump administration and a Biden administration in terms of how they deal with China. Why is that the case? Because as I said to you, it makes perfectly good sense for China to want to dominate Asia, and it makes perfectly good sense for us to want to prevent that from happening. And given those two logics, it's inevitable that you're going to get a security competition. And security competitions, especially intense security competitions involving great powers, sometimes end up in war. We have to hope that doesn't happen and we have to go to great lengths, and the Chinese have to go to great lengths to manage this competition, but it's going to be very tricky to do. And I know a number of people who are very smart, who think there is a high likelihood that over the next 20, 30 years, the United States and the Chinese will fight each other. And by the way, we did fight each other during the Korean War, 1950 to 1953. The United States was not fighting the North Koreans during those three years. The United States was fighting the Chinese. So it could happen. Let's hope it doesn't happen. So this is what, you know, this is what is on the horizon. Now, I want to make another point about the Chinese. From an American point of view, it's important to understand that China is potentially a much more formidable threat than the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. We have helped create a monster here. Let's go back to liberal hegemony. I told you before, liberal hegemony was designed to bring, it was designed to bring China into the open international economy that we had created and integrate them into international institutions like the WTO and help make China rich. That was our goal because we thought that would produce a democratic China. And you know the liberal story, a democratic China, a democratic America, a democratic Japan, we all live happily ever after. Well, that didn't happen. It didn't happen. And instead, we've created this Goliath. We have helped. The national security community in the United States has helped create a really powerful China. Now, you want to know how powerful that China is? The two principal factors that you want to look at when you think about assessing power are population size and wealth. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States 
had roughly the same size population and the Soviet Union had at its peak one third the gross national product of the United States. It was one third as wealthy, one third as wealthy, same size population. Population size wealth, those are the two building blocks. What about China? China today has four times as many people as the United States. And most demographic projections out to the year 2050 say they will have 3.7 times as many people as the United States. And in terms of wealth, if they have a per capita GNI or GNP that looks anything like South Korea, they will be twice as wealthy as the United States. So here's a country that in the year 2050 could conceivably have 3.7 times as many people, two times as much wealth, and we are taking them on 6,000 miles from the Chinese coast, I mean, from the California coast, 6,000 miles away. This is going to be really difficult. Containing China is going to be a huge task for us. But in my opinion, it's going to be the defining task of the 21st century moving forward. So just to recap, what I've told you is that we started in 1945 and we ran up to 1989 operating in a bipolar world where we engaged in hard-nosed realpolitik with the Soviet Union. And the Soviets went away, the Cold War ended, we were in a unipolar world, we pursued liberal hegemony. It was a liberal foreign policy through and through. In the American context, realism was off the table. It ran into huge problems for two reasons. One is nationalism, I told you that story. The second reason is we turned China into a great power. And once you have more than one great power, in other words, once you exit unipolarity, uh, you can't pursue a liberal foreign policy. You're back in a realpolitik world. That's where we are now. And of course, my argument is that there's not just uh, China to contend with, there's also Russia to contend with. So we have this multipolar world. And I think that from an American perspective, the world moving forward is a much more dangerous world than existed during the unipolar moment and even during bipolarity. Thank you. Dr. Mearsheimer, thank you very, very much for that. Um, I've got some questions and then I've got some questions from our audience. Um, so we talked about China, we talked about how it is the defining competition for the future or for, at least for the near future. And there are some options out there that people have put forward. Um, one is if we can, and maybe we can, pressure China to change how its economy works. That is less export oriented, more focused on domestic consumption. Or should we be pursuing some level of decoupling where we have economic blocks in the world, military alliances, for example, between say the US, Western Europe, and some of our Indo-Pacific allies versus China? Well, there's no question that we should go to great lengths to craft a military alliance to contain China, just the way we did in the Cold War uh, in Europe with NATO. And we had an alliance structure in East Asia as well. We had alliances with Japan, alliance with South Korea, and alliance with the Philippines, right? So we had alliances in the Cold War and they were very effective. Uh, I think the Trump administration wisely focused attention on containing China. But I think that the Trump administration did a poor job of organizing our allies in Asia to form a balancing coalition against China. And I hope that the Biden administration does a much better job of dealing with allies to put together uh, an alliance structure that can contain China. And this will not be an easy task because as you know, the countries in Asia that we will ally ourselves with to contain China are spread out all over the place. India, Australia, and Japan are all a great distance from each other. So putting together a balancing coalition will be a Herculean task, but it's necessary. Now, switching to the other dimension, the economic dimension, what the Trump administration has tried to do is it has tried to slow down Chinese economic growth. 
it's really focused a lot on slowing down Chinese technological growth. I think it's quite clear that what the Trump administration would like to do is wreck Huawei. We see Huawei as a serious threat to American technological supremacy. So what has happened here is that the United States has made a bet that it can damage the Chinese economy and not at the same time damage the American economy. And what will happen as a consequence is that the wealth gap between the United States and China, which now favors us, will widen in our favor. I do not believe that will happen. I hope that happens. I hope that the Trump administration's bet was the right one. But my gut tells me that that's not going to happen. Nevertheless, just to use your rhetoric, Duncan, I do think that there will be significant decoupling, not complete decoupling by any means, but there will be significant decoupling of the US economy and the Chinese economy over time. And that will be motivated in large part by security factors. So the next question, well, there are lots of questions here, but one of the next questions is, um, and this is mine, is that if you're gonna have allies, especially if you're gonna have military allies, one of the things you have to do is demonstrate to your allies that you will be there for them. One of our allies is Taiwan. Um, there has been a policy of ambiguity in place for many, many years now. Um, we're basically, basically we told the Chinese that we will defend Taiwan, but not explicitly. And we told the Taiwanese, don't do anything stupid that would force the you know, Chinese to either blockade or invade you. We do have people now, uh, various people within the national security establishment calling for uh, basically a policy of no more ambiguity. In other words, just flat out say, we will defend Taiwan, period. Your views on that? I think that would be a mistake. Uh, I think the present policy is sufficient. Uh, and uh, if it's not, you can make some subtle uh, indications, some, give some subtle hints that you will defend Taiwan if the Chinese are to attack it. Um, I think that the Chinese care so greatly about Taiwan that if we say that we have an unequivocal commitment to defend it, uh, it may lead the Taiwanese to behave in a rather bullshy fashion and prompt the Chinese uh, to attack Taiwan and be willing to pay enormous costs. This gets back to my point, Duncan, about the power of nationalism. What Taiwan is really all about is nationalism. From a Chinese point of view, Taiwan is sacred territory, and it's essential that it eventually be incorporated back into the mainland. Now, given the strategic competition that's heating up in East Asia, the United States has a profound interest in not letting China conquer Taiwan because of the message that would send to our allies in the region. So we are preparing to defend Taiwan, as we should. But at the same time, this is a delicate balancing act because of the power of nationalism and the need not to provoke the Chinese and not to give the Taiwanese any possibility of acting in a reckless way so as to provoke China. So I would keep the existing policy and drop subtle hints that make it clear that we're not gonna let China attack Taiwan. Okay. So the flip side to this whole argument is to basically let China become a regional hegemon just as the US has become. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem that you face is that if China becomes a regional hegemon, it's free to roam all over the planet and it's free to roam into the Western hemisphere. Uh, I often say to audiences, have you ever asked yourself, why is it that the United States is roaming all over God's little green acre, sticking its nose in every country's business? Why do we have military forces all over the planet? 
Well, one of the principal reasons is that we are free to roam because we have no security threats in the Western Hemisphere because we don't have to build military forces to deter anyone or fight anyone of any consequence in the Western Hemisphere, we can take those powerful military forces that we have the resources to build and we can move them all over the planet like it's a giant chessboard. Well, what you don't want China to be able to do is to be free to roam. You want China to have to worry about Japan, to have to worry about India, to have to worry about Russia, to worry about its neighborhood, and to focus lots of attention on its neighborhood so that it is, so that it is not free to roam into the Western Hemisphere. So that's the principal reason, in my opinion, to uh, go to great lengths to make sure China does not become a regional hegemon. What do you think the role of Japan, India, and Pakistan will be in preventing, potentially preventing Chinese he hegemony in Asia? I think, do you think they'll, they'll stand up to them? I don't think Pakistan will. I think Pakistan will be with the Chinese, right? The Indians will be with us, the Japanese will be with us, and the Australians will be with us. We talk about those four countries. Again, Australia, Japan, India, and the United States as the quad, right? And I think the quad is, you know, an, an essential building block for an alliance structure uh, in East Asia. Uh, and I think there'll be other countries like South Korea, the Philippines, uh, and so forth and so on, that'll be with us, Malaysia, uh, Singapore. But there'll be a number of countries that will be on China's side of the ledger. Uh, I think Cambodia fits in this category, North Korea for sure, Cambodia, uh, I'd bet Myanmar, and I'd bet Pakistan. Uh, I think the United States has been going to considerable lengths uh, to woo Pakistan and especially Myanmar away from China, because we understand it would be best from our point of view if they were on our side of the ledger. Uh, but I, I would not bet a lot of money that will happen, uh, especially because of the India-Pakistan conflict. Right? I can't see us having good relations with Pakistan and India and the two of them working with us to help contain China. I hope that happens, I hope I'm wrong. But I'll tell you, Duncan, the really interesting case is Russia. We should have the Russians on our side. The Russians should be our allies against China. And if you go to Moscow, there are quite a few Russians who will say that. But the United States, of course, has foolishly pushed the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. My great hope is that over time, as China becomes more powerful, and as the Belt and Road expands into places like Central Asia, one of the consequences of that will be that the Russians will see that they have a vested interest in aligning with us. We will see that we have a vested interest in aligning with them. And the Russians will be in the balancing coalition against China, uh, the American-led balancing coalition. But there's no evidence of that at the moment, sadly. So how would we do that? How would we get Russia to be on our side to balance with us? I mean, obviously, given the politics of the, of the last four years, the past administration, the new administration coming in, um, it doesn't seem like that's in the cards at the moment. It's not in the cards at the moment. I think the only thing that will do it is structural change. And you're saying to yourself, what exactly does he mean when he says the only thing that will do that is structural change? What I'm saying is I think that China will have to become so powerful that the Russians and the Americans really have no choice but to wake up and smell the coffee and to form an alliance. This is what happened with the Americans and the Soviet Union before World War II. As you know well, we did not recognize the Soviet Union. We, meaning the Americans, did not recognize the Soviet Union until 1933. Soviet revolution was in 1917, and we didn't recognize that country until 1933. And then even after 1933, we had terrible relations with the Soviet Union. Up until December 7th, really December 11th, 1941, when we jumped into bed with the Soviet Union, even though it was led by murderous Joseph Stalin. And the question is, why did we jump into bed with the Soviet Union in December 1941? One very simple, answer to deal with Nazi Germany. As evil as we thought the Soviets were, we knew we had to defeat Nazi Germany. That had to be our principal priority. 
And with regard to China, I do not want to equate China with Nazi Germany in the sense that Nazi Germany was, you know, a giant killing machine, murdering huge numbers of people. And I'm not putting China in that category, but I am saying that China in the story I'm telling will eventually be in all likelihood, not axiomatic, but in all likelihood, a really powerful country where I think the Russians and the Americans will have no choice, but come together to contain China. What's the role of the EU in this? How do we, how do we engage the EU or should we engage the EU in this competition? It's, this, is, this is a fascinating question. I think that militarily, the Europeans are basically useless for containing China. Uh, they don't spend much money on defense. I mean, this has been one of Obama's and Trump's main complaints about the Europeans. You want to remember both Obama and Trump complained bitterly, the Europeans don't spend enough money on defense. So these are countries that do not have the power projection capability that's necessary to build military forces to go to the East China Sea or the South China Sea, or even the Indian Ocean. I mean, they may send a ship or two, but they just don't have significant power projection capability. So militarily, the Europeans are not gonna be players in the game of containing China, but economically they're gonna matter. And the United States has a deep seated interest in working closely with the Europeans to make sure that they don't feed the beast. They don't trade dual use technologies that we want to make sure don't fall into the hands of the Chinese. So the, the Europeans matter economically. And I think, again, the Trump administration, as I said before, has done some smart things with the Chinese. But one of the principal problems with the Trump administration has been their attitude towards allies in general. Uh, they like to slap our allies around, both in Europe and Asia. And I don't think that's a wise policy. I think we want to work with our allies in Asia for all the obvious reasons. And we want to work with our allies in Europe, too, to make sure they're with us in helping to contain um, uh, China moving forward. Can you, um, can you comment on the Belt and Road Initiative and how that plays into all of this? Well, the Belt and Road Initiative is just a, 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 a broad-based policy by China to expand its economic and political influence all over the planet. They're kind of doing what the United States does. You know, we have globalization. Globalization is all about creating open international economic order where American goods and services and uh, finance can just sort of move around the world freely. And uh, it gives us great economic and political influence. And then, of course, when you do that, you also want to have a military, a military that can protect your economic and political interests around the globe. So if you talk to the Chinese behind closed doors, they'll tell you they're building a blue water Navy and that blue water Navy is gonna have significant power projection capability. And they're interested in protecting the Belt and Road. They're interested in protecting their sea lines of communication. Uh, so I say to myself, what's going on here? It's a very easy question to answer. They're imitating the United States in becoming a regional hegemon in Asia. They're imitating the United States in building a blue water Navy that can project power all over the world to a company belt and road. They're imitating the United States. The problem that we face, Duncan, is we live in a zero sum world. Two countries cannot simultaneously dominate the world's oceans. Only one can. And they wanna do it, we wanna do it. And the question you have to ask yourself is who's gonna win? And all at the same time, you want to remember, going back to liberal hegemony, we helped create this monster on purpose. So what do you think a Biden administration will do with respect to China going forward? I think that the Biden administration will go to great lengths to contain China. I think it has no choice. I think Biden used to be really soft on China. Biden was a big believer in liberal hegemony. Biden played a key role in helping turn China into Godzilla. But uh, those days are far behind him and he fully understands where we are now. And he's gonna be surrounded by all sorts of hawkish people 
who are going to want to work hard to contain China. Uh, my great hope is that he'll do it in a sophisticated way. And I think most importantly, he'll do a better job than President Trump did at dealing with our allies. I've hit on this point a couple times. I don't think Trump did a good job of, you know, uh, cobbling together uh, the, uh, a balancing coalition in Asia that can contain China. Uh, he's alienated, uh, you know, the Japanese to some extent, the South Koreans to some extent. And we have lots of problems with our allies in Southeast Asia who, you know, don't want to get too close to the United States because they tend to think that, you know, we're out of control. Uh, so the, the Biden administration is going to have to work very hard uh, to remedy that situation. And hopefully they'll do a better job than President Trump did. The, um, the demographics in China are such that you've got uh, a lot of older folks, younger folks having to take care of parents and grandparents. Um, there are some in the, in the Western world and including the United States who say, well, they really can't afford to do what they're doing militarily because they've got to take care of older generations. In other words, they're, they're thinking as Americans and Western Europeans think. There are others who say, no, they don't think like that. And they don't really care about their, the older populations and they'll do what they need to do. What do you think? Well, you, you, this is one of these issues where what people want to think doesn't matter that much. The question is, what are the realities of the situation? If you have an aging population, if you have more 80-year-olds than 8-year-olds, that has consequences. You can't pretend it doesn't matter. Uh, let me answer your question by just elevating my answer a bit. My comments on China have all assumed that it will continue to rise. I never addressed the question of whether it will arise, except when I said that President Trump has wagered that he can put uh, policies in place against China that can slow down its growth. And I said, I wasn't sure what would happen there. But my whole pitch tonight assumed that China will continue to grow. I can tell you from having given my talk on whether China can rise peacefully or not about 125 times that I have run into a substantial number of people, smart people, including in China, who believe that China has serious structural problems that are gonna slow down its growth over time. One of them, not the only one, but one of them is demographics. And the situation that you described Duncan, is a very real one, and the Chinese are fully aware of it, and it's, of course, a consequence of the one-child policy. And even though they've eliminated the one-child policy in large part, the Chinese are still not making lots of babies, and this has huge consequences. This is not such a problem for the United States because of immigration. We just import people, right? The Chinese don't operate that way. So this is going to cause them big problems in all likelihood. And they have other problems as well associated with banking uh, and so forth and so on. My view is let's hope these problems manifest themselves and let's hope that the Chinese economy slows down. And let's hope that the United States gets its act together and that we grow more and more powerful over time relative to China. I want to see the gap between us and the Chinese widen. So I hope these Democrat, demographic problems uh, come home uh, to haunt the Chinese. It's not that I dislike China per se. It's just that I don't want China to be a peer competitor. Got one more question, and then we're going to call it an evening. And that is, you talked about how the U.S. created China, how we created this monster in effect um, to compete with us. What should, we have been, what should we have done differently? We should have gone to great lengths to slow down Chinese growth uh, starting in the 1990s. Basically, the history here is that in 1979, Deng Xiaoping came to the United States and he figured out very quickly that the United States was doing something correct. And uh, the United States' allies, countries like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, they were doing something right because those countries were all flourishing. Uh, and China was in deep trouble. And he recognized that what had to be done was that China had to become a capitalist state. And 
starting in the early 1980s, they went down that road. From 1980 to roughly 1990, it was in our interest to integrate China into the international economy and help China grow. Why? Because we wanted China to help us balance against the Soviet Union. And therefore we wanted China to be as powerful as possible. This is why we helped Japanese and German resurrection after World War II. It wasn't purely for uh, moral or economic reasons. It was in good part for security reasons. We wanted Germany and Japan to be economically back on their feet so that they could build powerful militaries and help us contain the Soviet Union. That same logic applies in the, in, in the bipolar Cold War, War world. But what happens then is the Cold War ends. The Soviet Union goes away. And we're in the early 1990s. And the question is, what do you do with China then? And let's say you have two choices. One, you can integrate it into the international economy, integrate it into the WTO and assorted other institutions and help it grow into a really powerful country. Or you can try and slow down its growth. Which do you do? I would have tried to slow down its growth. Whether you could do it, you know, it's a tricky issue. But I would have at least tried. We didn't try. We didn't try to slow down its growth. We tried to help it grow. And our basic view was the more powerful it grew, the better. Because as it grew more powerful economically, as it integrated into these institutions, it would then become a democracy. And it would become what Robert Zellick called a responsible stakeholder. And we would all live happily ever after. That's why we help China grow. Because liberal hegemony, as I described it in my lecture was based on the assumption that turning countries like China into Russia and China and Russia into liberal democracies, integrating them into the open international economy and getting them into institutions would make them liberal democracies and responsible stakeholders. That was the underlying belief and it failed. And we now have two adversaries and one of them is not very dangerous despite all the Russophobia in the United States, that's Russia. But one of the other ones is really dangerous. That's China. It is, you know, given its population size and given the fact that the Chinese are really good at playing the capitalist game, uh, they are becoming more and more powerful relative to us with the passage of time. And this is not to our advantage. So this is why I say, I hope that Chinese economic growth slows down and I hope ours accelerates. Okay, sure. Thank you very, very much. This was a, it was a great talk tonight and I enjoyed the, the back and forth. And uh, thank you again. Um, for the folks online, our next talk is gonna be Wednesday, December 9th at 6 p.m. We're gonna talk about Russia, what drives them, uh, the lens through which they see the world, what their modus operandi is, et cetera. And our speaker is going to be Mr. Paul Goebel. He was the former communications director for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, former professor at the University of Tartu, Tartu and Tallinn in Estonia, and a former advisor to uh, Secretary of State James Baker on Soviet nationality issues and Baltic affairs. Until the next time, uh, for everybody, take care, be safe, be healthy. And again, to Dr. Mearsheimer, thank you again.